I don't consider democracy to be really functioning when one side's got a loudspeaker and the other side uh, is being forced to whisper. How have we managed to create a system in which a major voice or voices in a policy debate is not able to be heard because it doesn't raise enough money to buy the access to talk to the American people? Our democracy is drowning in free speech that's paid for by all these interests that have enough money to pay for the microphones and the airwaves to get their message out. It's who has the money to frame the issue. Because if you don't have the money to frame the issue, then whether you're right or wrong isn't going to matter in the long run. The government may still be a major threat to free expression, but commercial interests consolidating, particularly in the media business, could be an equal threat. If we have to rely on the media to at least analyze what the corporations are doing and the media don't do that, how do we level the playing field? I don't know. I don't know. Funding for this program is provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and by the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. Corporate funding is provided by Mutual of America, building America's future through pension and retirement plans, encouraging dialogue and discussion. The Spirit of America, Mutual of America. I'm Bill Moyers. The guarantee of free speech and the First Amendment to our Constitution is a great idea. It means government can't keep you from getting your two cents worth into the public debate. But what the framers of our government didn't reckon with is that two cents doesn't buy much free speech these days. You can say anything you want to say, but if you really want to be heard today, we're talking big money. The framers didn't reckon on the mass media, and they didn't reckon on the rise of huge corporations, private empires, with the money to buy the kind of free speech that guarantees a hearing. In this program, we'll look at what this means for democracy through three stories of powerful industries who knew what they wanted and got it. And we'll hear from some voices in the growing chorus of those who worry that corporations no longer simply take part in the public debate, they buy it. Duplin County, North Carolina, home to Cindy Watson. She made a name for herself here and a living selling ruffle curtains. She had never planned to go into politics. She was busy raising three children. And besides, only Democrats won elections in Duplin. I've always been a conservative and I've always been a Republican. And when my third district chairman just asked me to put my name in to run, I had no desire, had never been involved with government, local or any other ways. I was the first woman, and certainly the first Republican in 100 years, that was elected to the North Carolina General Assembly from this area. She was elected in 1995 to serve a small rural district. Her platform stressed tax reform and help for agribusiness. Her concerns included typical constituents, and some not so typical. In 815 square miles, we have a lot more hogs than people. Hog farming has exploded in North Carolina. It's now the state's largest agricultural industry, larger even than tobacco. The swine industry has been extremely good financially. We have car dealers that are selling fleets of trucks. We have restaurants here. When I moved here in 1976, there was not a Pizza Hut, there was not a Hardee's, there was not a McDonald's. But Watson found out all those pigs brought more than jobs and prosperity. The massive growth of hog farms meant massive growth of hog waste. She began to hear from constituents who told her hog waste is definitely not a good neighbor, especially when you live downwind. I really can't explain the odor. It's a nausea, almost a burning sensation to the eyes and nose, and it creates tremendous amount of flies. We don't have central heat and air in our house. In the summertime, we depend on cross ventilation, if you know what that is. All of a sudden, our bedroom is filled with this terrible stench, and it wakes me up 
with uh, asthmatic bronchitis attacks. I had screamed, I had kicked, I had cried, and nobody listens. In fact, if you tell them how it affects you, the hog roars, they laugh. They think it's funny. They say it doesn't stink, it smells like money. The hog population in Duplin County increased a staggering 1,400% in the last 20 years to about 2.3 million. But the corporate hog farms still dispose of the waste the way it had been done on independent farms like this one before hogs here numbered in the millions, collecting it in lagoons, then spraying it onto nearby fields. If you spray in hog fields, all right, that water's going down in the ground. Your water that you drink comes out of the ground. So it's going down to your ground to that water that you're going to drink sooner or later if you spray enough of it out of there. Ammonia gas evaporates from the lagoons and the spray fields, then falls back on the landscape. How do you like this? This is algae. At one time, this entire creek was clear on weekends or late in the afternoon. You could come through and families would be out here fishing. And as I've come back, we see all of our creeks that have a green covering over them from, I believe, thousands of the lagoon systems that are spraying ammonia and nitrogen into the air. She was seeing people being victimized by business interests that she had thought were, you know, trying to help America. Bob Hall is research director at Democracy South, a North Carolina public interest group. He's followed what happened after Cindy Watson began listening to her neighbors. And I was asking those questions that you asked to me. She was a feisty advocate for her people who were being inundated with this massive contamination from the hog factory farms. Ten parts per million is the EPA acceptable level uh, of drinking in this state. This is 17.18. However, she a went back to her core values and said, this is wrong, what you guys are doing, these big hog people. And you're my neighbors. And some of you even donated to help elect me as a Republican. But I can't do what you want me to do. I have to say no to you. No meant challenging the hog industry to clean up its act. But the corporate farmers had other plans. They wanted to expand even more, and they were used to getting their way. Many of the state's zoning laws were written in part by a former legislator named Wendell Murphy, who just happens to be the chairman and CEO of Murphy Family Farms, one of the biggest hog producers in America. He's on the Forbes list and so on. But he was a state senator for a number of years. And in that role, he passed and made sure it got passed a number of crucial pieces of legislation, one of which was that local counties couldn't zone hog factory farms. Uh, so th that really created the framework that allowed those farms to expand without anybody saying, no, no, you're getting a little too large. No, no, the amount of waste you're putting here is too dangerous. But Cindy Watson wouldn't back off. In 1997, she helped pass a moratorium to limit the growth of hog farms until the industry figured out a better way to dispose of all that waste. When she was up for re-election, she anticipated a tough campaign, but she never imagined what was about to hit her. It started just before the primary, when Duplin area voters began receiving probing phone calls. Do you consider yourself to be pro-life or pro-choice? At first, they seemed like objective opinion polls. They weren't. Cindy Watson is letting her personal attitudes affect her judgment and often doesn't have her facts right. Political pros call them push polls loaded questions designed to prejudice the voters' opinion of a candidate. Cindy Watson flips flops on the issue. It was clearly not, do you know that Cindy Watson is trying to regulate the hog industry? That wasn't what they wanted. They were looking for any possible way that they could embarrass, intimidate, undercut her credibility. Cindy Watson is misleading people about her record on the environment. Along with the telephone polling came a blizzard of ads. Representative Cindy Watson. Ads in newspapers, on the radio, on television. Public trust is lost when politicians mislead people. They all had the same theme, condemning Cindy Watson and shifting focus away from hog industry pollution. And they were costing somebody a bundle. But who was spending all that money? The ad said they were paid for by a group calling itself Farmers for Fairness. 
it's a wonderful name, Farmers for Fairness. You think of, you know, here, here's old McDonald and all the other old McDonald's. They've gotten together and they're fighting for fairness. Oh, it's wonderful. Here at home, Representative Cindy Watson is Well, it turns out, you know, it's not at all that way. It turned out that Farmers for Fairness was a cover for a consortium including Murphy Family Farms and other corporate hog interests. It's what's known as a front group. These are groups that, to any ordinary citizen, you have no idea what the group is for, and you certainly don't associate them with some powerful interest. Charles Lewis runs the nonprofit Center for Public Integrity in Washington, D.C. His most recent book documents the influence of big money in politics. The idea of the front group is it's got to have a highfalutin, nice-sounding name. It's got to uh, invariably not release any of its information about who funds it. And the reason that's valuable to that industry is it's another voice. It's another uh, entity in the political process saying this is a good thing or a bad thing, whatever the subject is. And so you'll create the sense that there's a growing chorus of concern over some issue. Farmers for Fairness spokesperson is Lou Ann Coe. What's your operating budget? Um, I, we don't release that. <laughs> um, it has been, I can tell you this, it's been more than we ever wanted to spend. Your own consultant says Farmers for Fairness spent $10,000 a week in the months before the May primary in that one little district. Why was that district so important to you? That is the heart of hog country. That's the heart right there. And that's where Miss Watson is. Representative Cindy Watson. They mounted a massive campaign, an almost unbelievable campaign, for a Republican woman from a very small county trying to get rid of her, trying to just uh, abolish her from the scene. Paid for by Farmers for Fairness. Here's an important distinction to keep in mind. Federal election laws strictly regulate ads that tell you to vote for or against a candidate. These ads can only be run by the candidates themselves, by political parties, or by political action committees, PACs, all subject to strict limits on corporate contributions. The idea is that candidates should know who is financing their opposition, that you, the voter, should know who's putting money up to influence elections. So, if you buy an ad that does advocate voting for or against someone, you have to file disclosure forms. But there's a gaping loophole in the law. If your organization buys an ad that doesn't use those exact words, vote for or against, it's considered issue advocacy. And issue ads are not regulated by campaign laws. Representative Cindy Watson blames hog farmers for polluting rivers. In other words, it can walk right up to the line of telling you why you should vote against someone or for someone. It just can't take that last step and make it explicit. Kathleen Hall Jamison is dean of the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. She writes extensively on how so-called issue advocacy has become a funnel for unregulated money in politics. The practical matter is this. When you get into an election season and you see an ad that shows a candidate's picture, and it's an unflattering picture, and it tells you a lot of things about the candidate that are hostile, they are not friendly to the candidate, and the ad then closes by saying, call this number. For practical purposes, everything up to that last moment has looked like it's an ad that's going to tell you how to vote. Why else would people spend money to show you unflattering pictures and give you hostile information in a context in which the election is about to occur? Were you trying to get people to vote against her? We were trying to change opinion. And if, if the people out there looked at our message and said, well, now that makes sense. I haven't heard that side of it before. And maybe what Ms. Watson is saying isn't quite all there is to it. Then if they voted against her, fine. If they didn't, that was fine. They were using this issue ads, and this is something new to me and new to all of us, I think, um, of this is the way to do it. It's First Amendment speech. They can say anything they want to as long as they did not say for or against me. We are not a political action committee. We are just exercising our First Amendment right to free speech. And we, are, we even were so conscious of following the letter of the law that we had an attorney who was an electoral law expert to vet each one of our ads and our polls to tell us, is this correct? Can we do this or, or not? They use all this legal trickery to, to you know, issue ads or 
uh, independent expanded, you know, all these different things that are, are very calculated. But at its core, it's politics. And it's companies who can't vote using their treasuries, their resources, to influence voting. So one would assume that there are corporate donations in Farmers for Fairness. Well, yes, absolutely. Exercising their free speech, and that's how you see it. It's the only way they could get it. Is to buy it. That's to buy it. It's the only way we could get it. We don't like to spend money, so we want to make sure that every dollar we do spend, it's on target. Was it? Seemed to be. Cindy Watson lost the Republican primary to a hog farmer. Her campaign budget did not include a single television ad. No exact figure is available on how much the hog industry spent to defeat her, but records show Farmers for Fairness spent $2.6 million on media activities in the year leading up to the primary. The State Board of Elections eventually challenged the group's tactics, but a federal court ruled they'd done nothing illegal. The courts have generally sided with corporations on issue advertising, essentially saying that limiting spending is limiting speech. But some legal scholars say it's how huge companies influence politics in ways the Constitution never intended. You could do a PhD thesis in the law on the strange way we treat corporations sometimes as though they were human beings and sometimes as though they were not. Bert Newborn, once the national legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union, is now legal director of the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University. For example, for the Fifth Amendment, we never gave that to corporations. Corporations don't have the right to be free from self-incrimination. People working in corporations do. But if the corporation were to come into an American court and say, I take the Fifth Amendment, the judge would laugh. The judge would say, you don't have any Fifth Amendment rights. Get out of here. But with the First Amendment, we went exactly the opposite way. We said, no, corporations are going to be treated as though they are a, a human being, and they're going to be given the same rights to speak that human beings are given. In 1978, a Supreme Court ruling effectively gave corporations some of the same free speech rights previously reserved for individuals. The people who will defend the decision say, look, what the 1978 decision did is unleash this great machine for the generation of information and that we are richer as a political culture now because we have the corporations um, uh, able to, to, to put, in, put ideas and um, uh, uh, information out into the public. That's the one side of the debate. The other side of the debate would say, yes, but the one thing that corporations do better than anybody else is to accumulate money. And for the corporation then to dump that money into the democratic process is to unbalance the market and ideas uh, in a way that, uh, uh, that uh, yes, it's richer, but it's richer in one direction. It's long been the case that money talks, but in the modern electronic square, where rich corporations exercise First Amendment rights through unregulated spending, big money can shout, can shout from one end of the country to the other. It happened just recently in a major policy debate in Congress. Powerful corporations using their resources not only to mislead the public, but to intimidate the United States Senate. Spring 1998. After months of negotiations, Congress is moving toward passing the McCain bill, legislation to hold the tobacco industry accountable for the effects of smoking. The bill had been passed out of committee by an overwhelming majority and looked like a sure winner. Under the agreement we have reached, even tobacco industry leaders were willing to sign on. But when the bill was amended to threaten their exemption against future lawsuits, they left the table. The extraordinary settlement that could have set the nation on a dramatically new and constructive direction is dead. Seven days after the Senate no Commerce problem. Committee passed a bill far tougher than the tobacco industry ever thought they would pass, Steve Goldstone and R.J. Reynolds bolted from the process and with them took all of the other tobacco companies. Matthew Myers is general counsel for the nonprofit group Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And then all hell broke loose. Washington has gone cuckoo again. Instead of doing something about youth smoking, Washington wants to raise half a trillion dollars in new taxes, spend billions on federal programs, create... Tobacco companies didn't have public opinion or a majority in Congress on their side. 
but they did have one thing their opponents didn't. They had money. All they needed to wage a massive propaganda war. It's Christmas in Washington, and they're piling big presents under They the began tax tree. with air attacks, a bombardment of issue advertising. Over $40 million was spent on this campaign, the highest amount ever spent in a sustained issue advocacy campaign in the United States. In a study for the Annenberg School, Kathleen Hall Jamison examined the claims of tobacco's ad campaign. The underlying themes of that issue advocacy campaign were that this bill is a big tax and spend bill for special programs, the implication is, and you wouldn't approve of them, that will result in a black market and will not actually produce a reduction in youth smoking, but will produce very expensive cigarettes. That combination of appeals aired at saturation level across cable in the United States increased the likelihood that people were misled about the content of the bill. The tobacco tax some in Congress are talking about doesn't make any sense. The propaganda was carefully targeted to influence not just the public, but the senators who'd be voting on the bill. More taxes for more big government. I'm going to remember this fall what the politicians do this summer. The $40 million advertising campaign was designed to change the framework of the debate, not so much because they were going to change American public opinion, but because they were going to make it acceptable to vote against this bill by making a vote, a vote against big government, big spending, and big taxes, and not a vote for big tobacco. These are the real heroes of the American economy, men and women across this country who work hard for their families. And suddenly, the tobacco industry became the protector of the blue-collar worker, the bastion against big government. Last June, there was a historic resolution of tobacco issues. This would have changed... The ads launched salvo after salvo of half-truths and distortions. Now politics has taken over. Instead of a reasonable debate on the resolution, Washington has gone haywire, proposing the same old tax and spend. Well, the interesting question is, what are the taxes on? And the answer is cigarettes. And what's the spending for? And it's a list of things that most people, if asked, would approve of, such as paying the states back for the Medicaid expenditures they've incurred by providing insurance coverage and health care for those who otherwise couldn't afford it but who were ill because of tobacco use. And who will pay the majority of these taxes? Working people, people earning $30,000 a year or less. Will the bulk of the cost of this bill be paid by people making under $30,000? Yes, it will, but with one important qualification. All of those people are smokers. And so it's not you, the person making under $30,000, who's seeing the ad. It's you, the smoker. And the reason for taxing is, in fact, not the government's appetite for additional money. Cigarettes up to $5 a pack, $50 a carton. The reason for additional taxing is to create an economic disincentive for teenagers to smoke. There will be new federal spending, 17 new government bureaucracies. 17 new government bureaucracies is simply false. There's no evidence in the bill that there are 17 new bureaucracies. Not even the source that cited Morgan Stanley would argue that there are 17 new bureaucracies. And these sources up on the screen suggest to you that some neutral source did a study to conclude here that there are 17 new government bureaucracies. But when you look at the source, what you're going to find out is, first, it isn't a Morgan Stanley study. It's a Morgan Stanley employee. And he's summarizing a speech by a tobacco company executive. As you move claim by claim through this ad, there are very few claims in the ad that don't have some need for contextualization. Big taxes, big government, big job losses. The tobacco companies use more than just advertising to manipulate the Congress. What the tobacco industry successfully did was used phone banking to call people around the country. And they would then describe this bill in a way that had no resemblance to what the bill looked like, and say to the individual on the other side, if you want to tell your member of Congress how opposed you are to it, we'll patch you through for free. Um, members of Congress got phone calls from people who didn't even know what bill it was they were calling about sometimes. But you can't get away from the fact that members of Congress count the number of communications they get from their constituents. What is John McCain thinking? He and President Clinton want to tax 50 million adult They Americans. also went after the conservative Republican senator who sponsored the bill, John McCain of Arizona. We thought Senator McCain was for lower taxes and less government. 
Well, I've got to say that uh, the tobacco companies uh, raised my name ID according to a poll to around 70 percent. It became a household word, uh, McCain, unfortunately, more like four letters in some households. But I really became aware of it, really graphically aware of it, when phone calls to both my home and office and being stopped in the street by people parroting the tobacco ads, which said, what's happened to John McCain? He's become a big tax and spend liberal and a big government liberal. People literally would stop me in the street and say, what's happened to you, John? Like as if I'd experienced some accident or illness. It's the largest consumer tax in history. It hits middle and lower income Americans the hardest. It was a it dishonest was campaign. No one requires that it be an honest campaign, but it was patently false. So does the First Amendment give corporations the right to lie? The First Amendment, I think, gives corporations the right to lie. But I also believe that one of the lessons here is that when journalists and media see that there is a lie being perpetrated on the American people, that it also deserves coverage. And the media, in this case, in my view, uh, probably did not do as much in informing the American people about these ads as they could have. Well, the news media, in this case, owned by large corporations who profited enormously from those ads. I mean, the profits from the ads went to the television stations, which are owned by, as you know, corporations. I would not like to make the accusation that there was a connection, but uh, I do believe that the media, especially television news, could have done a lot more in covering this, this if only in the fact that it was unprecedented in its scope and expense. Jameson's research showed that during the months of the debate over the McCain bill, while Big Tobacco was spending millions on TV to defeat it, only one nightly network news show, ABC's, ran a story examining the claims of the industry ads. Coverage was minimal as well on cable TV, which raked in much of the campaign's millions in advertising revenue. The larger question then is this. If you're getting that kind of income out of this advertising process, don't you have some obligation to provide some alternative access to the alternative points of view? The tax falls upon the American people. While TV news offered scant critiques of the tobacco campaign, the messages of the ads were echoed verbatim on the Senate floor. There is a requirement in the bill that the money be collected from these hardworking, low-income Americans. And to create more federal bureaucracies in big government than we've ever created by one vote. Among the most vociferous was a politician who for years had been one of the top recipients of campaign contributions from Big Tobacco. What the tobacco bill is about is tax and spend. Kentucky's Mitch McConnell did more than carry the industry's message. He flexed its muscle. Hours before the Senate was to take the most important vote on the McCain bill, a vote whether to go forward or not, Senator Mitch McConnell, who was then and still is the chairman of the Republican Senate Campaign Committee, had a closed-door meeting with his fellow Republican senators. And he's acknowledged that at that meeting, he told them that if senators voted to kill the McCain bill, they didn't need to worry that their political constituents would see it as a vote for big tobacco because the tobacco industry had promised that they would continue to run the ads that they had been running for months, long after the vote and well into the campaign season. In other words, translated into simple English, the industry's advertising is going to help you get reelected. Mr. Biden, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Bond. Tobacco won the war. Corporate Mrs. spending Boxer. had turned the tide against a popular bill. I would remind you that we passed this bill out of a 20-member committee, one-fifth of the United States Senate, by a vote of 19 to 1. Everyone predicted that the bill would then pass through the Senate after some debate and amendments. Ended up not making it. Every corporation, every special interest, whether you like them or not, is entitled to ensure that its message is heard. But you can't get away from the fact that the influence of money so distorts the free speech that it's no longer an honest and fair debate among competing ideas. It's who has the money to frame the issue, because if you don't have the money to frame the issue, then whether you're right or wrong isn't going to matter in the long run.
I'm not suggesting that one point of view doesn't deserve access. It does. In fact, that's a premise of democracy. Views that we find abhorrent have access to our system. That's protected speech. But what happens if we inadvertently create a situation in which, by virtue of privileging those with money, we make it very difficult for those without to be heard at all? You know, up until 1978, we lived quite well as a free society with good free speech law uh, without saying that corporations uh, would have an unlimited amount of mon uh, power to spend any amount of money they want to on politics. Seems to me now that we could say to corporations, look, you've got a pretty good deal. You've got limited liability. You have unlimited life. You can collect as much money as you want, but you can't spend it on politics um, unless one of two things happens unless you agree to cap it at an amount that won't totally uh, um, distort the democratic process, or unless we find some way to fund the voices on the other side so that we can then have a full-scale debate. Uh, but I don't consider democracy to be really functioning when one side's got a loudspeaker and the other side uh, is being forced to whisper. I know that the American Civil Liberties Union, your old colleagues and friends, uh, remains fundamentalist on the First Amendment. No abridgment whatsoever of corporate speech or anybody's speech. You clearly don't see eye to eye with them. No, I mean, um, I, I don't think Madison put that First Amendment in there just as a device to protect rich people's ability to dominate the political discourse. I think Madison put the First Amendment in the Constitution because he was aspiring toward uh, an ideal democracy, toward a democracy of equals, in which individuals could speak, in which the polity would be a polity of, of freestanding individuals who could exchange information uh, and have that information be used as the, as the mechanism for, for voting choice. When the founders were conceptualizing freedom of speech, if there were the tobacco industry and there were the anti-tobacco folks, the tobacco industry could take its stump and stand up on the stump and say to the audience, it's a tax and spend bill that will create huge government bureaucracies in order to pay for special programs in a federal Christmas tree with a black market, and it won't help kids stop smoking. And the anti-tobacco people could stand up and say, smoking is killing our children. This bill has money to reimburse the states for the cost of absorbing the costs of the deaths caused by the industry. We want a campaign to minimize children's use of a product that has been advertised to them, even though the tobacco industry said they weren't advertising it. And the tobacco industry could get up and rebut that position, and the audiences could come and listen to both or listen to either, but they each would have a stump. We're now in an environment in which the tobacco industry buys its stump and gets up and makes its statement. The anti-tobacco people don't have the money to buy the stump, and in effect, the tobacco industry has bought the access that the other side can't afford. We've now made freedom of speech, freedom of speech if you can afford to buy the access to speak. Buying media time your opponents can't afford is certainly one way to monopolize the public debate. But it's not the only way to use free speech to advance and protect your interests. Some corporations don't just buy media time. They buy the media. It's a media of belief. A media of belief. The whole media is controlled by a few corporations thanks to deregulation by the FCC. This was a satire from Saturday Night Live. They own networks from CBS to CNBC. They can use them to say whatever they please and put down the opinions of anyone who disagrees. Was it a vision inspired by paranoia or a cogent look at the future of free speech? When it is the media itself that decides not only what advertisements to take that are political in nature, but what free information to provide the public called news. And we've then deregulated, allowed them to own more within their industries. Um, we've let loose uh, uh, a giant here. Gene Kimmelman, co-chairman of Consumers Union in Washington, D.C., has tracked the growing impact of media conglomeration on public policy. It is dangerous in an open, free society like ours because we rely on the media so much for public discourse, for, for the expression of democratic values. Well, what does it matter that uh, Disney owns ABC or that General Electric owns NBC? What does it matter to us? The danger is not just when it's Disney, GE. It's when there are very few companies that control 
the most popular media outlets. And there's a policy issue that comes up that could hurt them financially. It is very unlikely we're going to get a full airing of that kind of an issue. Case in point, the 1996 Telecommunications Act. In February of that year, industry leaders from phone to cable to satellite to broadcast gathered alongside government officials to celebrate a revolutionary revision of America's communications law. This was a love fest. This was the president and the vice president getting together with the speaker and the majority leader and the leaders of the committees that had moved this legislation. After all, this was historic. This was the major overhaul of telecommunications policy, first time in 60 years, since 1934. Today, with the stroke of a pen, our laws will catch up with our future. There was talk of millions of jobs, tremendous GNP growth, competition, choice for consumers, new services never dreamt of, lower prices. Uh, it was a panacea. This bill is an indication of what can be done when Republicans and Democrats work together in a spirit of genuine cooperation to advance... What the president didn't say was that the bill's real beneficiaries included the media giants themselves, who had lobbied long and hard for the bill's passage. Here you have the broadcast industry actively working to transform television. Jeff Chester runs the Center for Media Education in Washington, D.C. Television's going to change. Consumers are going to have to buy a new TV set. There are going to be many, many more channels. The rules that determine how accountable local broadcasters are to their community are being weakened. Uh, station license uh, 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 periods are being extended. In essence, the Telecommunications Act uh, was like giving the broadcasters a blank check uh, with uh, television. Do with it what you want. One thing television broadcasters wanted and got was the lifting of restrictions on the number of stations one company could own. But it was another provision buried deep within the act that stood to make them billions, the free use of something called the digital spectrum. The average American does not know what digital spectrum is. They just don't know. Nor, frankly, should they have to know. They're working and <laughs> being with their families, uh, etc. But here in Washington, their assets that they own were being given away. Again, let me thank you from the bottom of my heart, every one of you, for making this great day for America possible. Thank you. What was being given away amounted to a set of new channels over which it's possible to bring us a much better high-definition picture. But broadcasters see in these new channels something more, marketing opportunities never before imaginable over the publicly owned airwaves. Having a piece of the digital spectrum is like having the keys to Fort Knox. Digital technology will allow broadcasters to take the one channel that they have right now and turn it into five, 10, even 20 or more uh, channels. Digital technology will allow broadcasters to create interactive channels, which allow you to click on a commercial, to buy a product. They want to take that piece of free spectrum, chop it up into a lot of little channels, and make piles of money uh, from this valuable resource. Now, since we as the people own it, you might ask, why aren't we selling it to the broadcasters and using that money for all sorts of social goods? Well, that's a whole other question, and it might speak to the lobbying power of the broadcast industry. These people that bring us the news, that objectively cover the news, are out there trying to influence Congress in Washington as much as anybody. Like the other telecom industries, broadcasters had been pouring millions into campaign contributions to Congress. But that wasn't all they were doing. The broadcasters had hundreds of lobbyists spread all over the hill for a couple years leading up to that period. But the reason they're so powerful is they don't just give a lot of money out, and they just don't have a phalanx of lobbyists smothering Capitol Hill with their positions. But they have one advantage that no one else has. They control the fate of all politicians. Let me tell you how they do that. There's an issue before the Congress which affects their industry. Call in the station managers from the congressman's district or the senator's state. They all come to Washington. They sit down in a room with a senator or representative. Now, there's never any 
threats made. There's never any statement that if you don't do this, we're going to say bad things about you in our newscast. But they are the messengers. They are the messengers. They portray you and your work here in Washington to the people of your state or district. That's incredibly powerful. In the language of the bill that we will be considering... John McCain was no one of the few senators who opposed the giveaway of the digital spectrum. Another was Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole. Now let me get this straight. America lends the broadcasters a national resource so they can increase their profit margins, but they don't think it's fair to pay rent. But Dole and McCain were lonely voices. I heard and saw many other members of Congress who said, look, this is, this is good for America. They're gonna, all Americans are going to get a much better picture on their TV set. Uh, things are going to be great. And I agree with all that. But why should a profit-making corporation get that asset for free and not have to pay for it? Mr. President, when something is owned by the taxpayer and is of great value, and we have a way of taking that very valuable commodity that's owned by the taxpayers and auctioning it off, the digital spectrum could bring the public up to $70 billion at auction, but the broadcasters didn't want an auction. Basically, they wanted the spectrum for free. If we'd said, look, we've got $10 billion worth of public land out there in the West, and we're going to give it to various corporations in America for them to use, and they're going to give us back some other land which really isn't nearly as good in exchange for that, the American people would never stood for such a thing, ever. From ABC News, it had all the makings of a major news story. Were powerful corporations picking the pocket of the taxpayer? It's the very kind of thing that broadcast journalism often investigates. After all, TV news loves a scandal. We have on NBC, what is it called, the fleecing of America. Where were they? when their own networks and other TV stations were in fact uh, lobbying and getting what they wanted out of the Telecommunications Act. The provision of news is Dean Alger is author of the book Mega Media, a study of corporations and mass media. And he examined the coverage of the Telecom Act on the three nightly network news broadcasts from the beginning of the Senate debate till the night before the bill was passed. The Telecommunications Act was introduced uh, roughly in May 1995 and was finally passed in early February 1996. During that nine months, the, the three network news shows, NBC, ABC, CBS, aired a sum total of only 19 minutes on this Telecommunications Act. None of that 19 minutes included a single mention of the debate over whether broadcasters should pay for use of the digital spectrum. If five senators took a legitimate trip somewhere, overseas to investigate something that might be costing the American people money. That reported on the evening news as a junket, costing thousands and thousands of dollars. And that would be news. And maybe it is news. Maybe it should be reported. But when it comes to a billion dollar giveaway to them, mum's the word. You will not see this story on any television or hear it on any radio broadcast because it directly affects uh, them. You but said from the Senate floor, we will not see this story on any television or hear it on any radio broadcast because it directly affects them. And did you? Did you hear anything on? No. I never heard. I saw a few print stories about it, but never did I see a television program. Later on, there was one, I believe, on CBS, but the coverage as compared with what any other story of this magnitude would have gotten was minuscule. The media did not want to discuss what it was doing. It, it would be like a bank robber stopping the bank robbery and saying, look at what we're doing here. Let's, let's have a press conference in front of the bank while we're doing it. I mean, uh, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, everyone, no, who wanted to discuss this? They're all going to make hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars over the next several years. The last thing they want to do is have a discussion I do think we should resolve this spectrum issue before the bill is considered. Dole finally agreed to support the Telecom Act in exchange for a promise that an auction might still be possible. In the months following, Broadcast News paid scant attention to the issue. Meanwhile, the broadcast lobby sprang into action. Air is a wonderful thing. With issue advertising. We all breathe it, and it's free. We use the air, too. Ads like this were careful not to mention the spectrum auction. Instead, 
They claim Congress was planning to tax viewers. Now Congress has a new idea. They tax everything else. Why not the airwaves? You'll have to pay more to watch your favorite shows, and we could lose them altogether. Call toll-free and tell Congress not to tax the airwaves. Tell them. In the spring, Congress quietly gave the broadcasters what they wanted. There would be no auction. They got $70 billion worth of free airwaves. The then head of the Federal Communications Commission called it the biggest corporate giveaway this century. So this industry has been dumping obscene amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars into the process around the time of this key legislation. And we've had no public discussion about it. The public can't get upset about it because they don't know about it. Because these guys control the airwaves, they have, quote unquote, free speech. They're protecting our First Amendment rights. I feel much better when I go to bed at night knowing that. I do a lot of interviews on consumer issues. I have news crews coming in all the time to talk about a variety of issues. And they always ask, what aren't we covering? What else could we, could we cover? And I always say, you know, there's one very important issue out there. There's enough money involved in this issue that you could probably provide health insurance for everyone in this country who doesn't have it. Or you could provide a major tax cut to the middle class and low income people. The broadcasters then always show interest. What is the issue? I mean, that much money on the table, there's that much, this is such a big issue, what is it? And I say, it's if we just charge fair market value for the spectrum broadcast companies receive for free from the public. Usually there's silence, maybe a grin. Uh, most, most say, oh, come on, there's no way we're ever gonna get to do that, that kind of a segment. Are you suggesting some deep, dark, mysterious conspiracy at work here? Absolutely not. You don't need to, to cook up some dark, deep conspiracy. This is an age-old phenomenon of willful people uh, wanting to acquire wealth and power, whether the power is formal governmental power or, in this case, building enormous empires. It's not easy to get on the air criticizing the media giants. On stories affecting their interest, no news is good news. Jim Hightower had a syndicated radio show on ABC. Jim Hightower on a Saturday. The Disney deal came down to buy Cap City's ABC, and Hightower challenged it, said it was Mickey Mouse. Uh, uh, Jim, I, I've, got, I've got news for you. Who is this? Well, this is your, your new boss. I'm the chairman of the board. Mickey Mouse? That's right. And then he challenged the whole Telecommunications Act and said this is not good for the public. Now, bear in mind, we're not talking about monopoly here over toasters. We're talking about monopoly over your access to news and information. And it's information that you and I need if we are going to have a democracy in this country. Well, he was off the air fairly quickly. Now, ABC said they didn't like the ratings at that point in time. The program just wasn't successful. Um, now, that may be true. The problem for the public is we'll never know. We're threatened here not just as consumers, but as citizens. It's our democracy that's at stake. Now, you might say to yourself, well, the media have never reported on their owners or on their behind-the-scenes dealings. And you'd be right. There was no golden age of self-scrutiny by the press lords. What's different today is that never before have so much media been controlled by so few owners. For example, whether you're watching ABC News, a History Channel documentary, sports on ESPN, a Lifetime movie, or commentary on E, you're watching Disney. And that's just scratching the surface. Disney brings you information via newspapers, magazines, radio stations, local TV stations, and of course, movies. If you watch Fox News, the FX Channel, or the Family Channel, you're watching a tiny fraction of Rupert Murdoch's powerful News Corporation. A global media empire controlling newspapers, book publishers, regional sports networks, even the satellites capable of delivering programming to 75% of the world. U.S. and NATO officials fear... The when you watch CBS News, the national network, or listen to any one of more than 170 radio stations, including several in the same cities, you're hearing from CBS Inc. And just consider this. Not only do these corporations have more media outlets to protect and promote their interest, they've never had so many different interests to promote and protect. Just take one example. The ultimate industrial media conglomerate is General Electric that controls NBC. 
and MSNBC and CNBC, etc. What is General Electric involved in besides media? Well, in fact, they're in everything from jet engines to abrasives to nuclear and, and other electrical generating systems, hotels, insurance and finance. When NBC reporters come upon some issue involved in those industrial areas, are they going to think twice about what they cover? There's a built-in profound conflict of interest. It means that uh, you're not going to be investigating certain subjects. Uh, it means that you're not going to see NBC investigating General Electric. You're not going to have ABC doing a big, lengthy investigation about Disney. I heard Michael Eisner, head of Disney, on National Public Radio say, I don't want ABC News covering Disney. I don't want Disney covering Disney. If ABC doesn't cover Disney, maybe for some good reasons, we may not have enough other people to cover Disney. The media giants are making so many deals with each other that companies that might normally be considered competitors are instead becoming partners. This very exclusive club has developed that determines, uh, you know, what we see uh, uh, on TV. This club goes to Congress and gets whatever they want, uh, for the most part, uh, in terms of access to the media system, but we're all left out of the picture. The picture is even murkier than you think. Look at the case of Telecommunications, Inc., known to its 14 million cable subscribers as TCI. The Discovery Channel, The Learning Channel, and Animal Planet are all joint ventures between TCI and Cox Communications, itself a media giant. With Comcast, yet another cable giant, TCI owns the shopping channel QVC. Then there's Bravo. TCI owns a piece of that channel, but so do GE and Cablevision, which is even more complicated than it sounds because TCI also owns a third of Cablevision. TCI's 10% stake in Time Warner, whose cable operation ought to be TCI's fierce competitor, gives them instead an interest in Time Warner's vast holdings, over 24 book publishers, 30 cable and satellite networks, film studios like Warner Brothers, and music and magazine holdings that link up with the likes of Sony. And that's not all. TCI even owns two-thirds of the company that produces the NewsHour on public television. All this must make TCI one of the true big fish of telecom, right? Well, yes, but not too big to be swallowed up by an even bigger fish. In 1999, TCI was bought by AT&T, the very monopoly regulators once broke up to spur competition. This is a tremendous danger for our society because uh, if it's the car business and there is mergers and consolidation, we fear higher prices less choice, concentration of ownership, and we try to monitor. But if we make a mistake, you can break it up, challenge it. The facts are out there to the public. If it's a media co company merging with another major media company, once it has occurred, who is going to take it on? And what about that Saturday Night Live satire on NBC that did take on the media giants? Well, it ran only once, on a live broadcast. Then it mysteriously disappeared from the show during reruns. The executive producer said, quote, I don't think it worked comedically. You have said that money and speech is the issue of the 21st century. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean the relationship between money and speech. I mean whether people who have the money are going to so dominate the ability to express their opinions that people who don't have the money are going to be turned into listeners, not speakers. I'm not satisfied with that. I'm not satisfied with a two-tier First Amendment that says a relatively small slice of the world gets to decide what gets said, and all the rest of us sit like groundlings in the, in the, in the audience and grunt about whether we like it or not. Uh, because that's, that's what we're going to, unless we can find a way to increase the ability of people without large amounts of money to either get access to the media, to get access to the political process, uh, to in some way break through the huge screen that money creates these days so that they can get their voices heard as well. 
The First Amendment is aspirational. It's romantic. It says that the purpose is to create a world in which people can speak freely and equally to one another. And therefore, there's an obligation to step in at some point and even the playing field so that individuals can actually have real discussions and real debates. Because what we've now got is not a real democracy with real debate, but we've got a plutocracy in which money talks. This law also recognizes that with freedom comes responsibility. It clearly enables the age of possibility in America to expand, to include more Americans. I congratulate the broadcasters and their surrogates here in the Senate and in the Congress. I congratulate them for their incredible influence uh, that has prevented us from mandating an auction of the spectrum which belongs to the taxpayers. We're going to be back later with my interview with my new bosses at ABC, Mickey Mouse. It's a big mess, literally. <laughs> Funding for this program is provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and by the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. Corporate funding is provided by Mutual of America, building America's future through pension and retirement plans, encouraging dialogue and discussion. The spirit of America, Mutual of America.